Welcome to our closing session. For those of you I don't know, I'm Linda Longmire, um, professor at the Department of, um, what is my department these days? <laughs> Global Studies and Geography. That's why I have my students here to remind me. Um, thank you so much for sticking it out. I'm sorry we don't have a bigger crowd. People may filter in and out because it's the end of the semester and everyone has you know, presentations and all of that. But we're so grateful for, and we will be filming the high quality of this panel and reflection. So thanks to all of you for, for being here. Um, again, so many thanks to be given, most of which I did this morning, but I did want to again mention um, how great it was to have support from and connection to Glucksman Ireland House in at NYU. They have been, um, and Kevin um, Kenny has been extremely helpful in suggestions and um, so very grateful for that. As we said before, it takes a village to run a symposium just as it takes a big passionate village to craft a peace agreement and so uh, we're grateful for our neighbors to the west um, who are who are their own wonderful village uh, focused on Irish studies. So, a couple quick things. We will have a little reception in the back afterwards. There'll be time for questions and answers and dialogue, extremely important. Very grateful this morning, I didn't mention to my wonderful students who will be going to Derry in order to de dig deeper into um, not only the history, but also the possible strategies and next steps. And um, they're so excited they can hardly contain themselves, but, um, but we are um, I was grateful for their sharing this morning. Before um, I introduce uh, you to my colleague, Mark McAvoy, who will be moderating this panel, um, I wanted to share, we wanted to share a reading by one of our students, the very famous, the curate Troy, which really kind of is the spirit, uh, the Seamus Haney poem, which is sort of this, embodies the spirit of what we're trying to do, both the history and the hope that is part of peace building in this, yes, troubled place, but um, extraordinary place that I know we all love. Melanie? Human beings suffer. They torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. The innocent and gals beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. History says don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope in history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracle and cures and healing wells. Call miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing, double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain or lightning and storm and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life at its term. Thank you. Great. So um, again, thanks to my, my colleague, um, Mark McAvoy, who will moderate and chair the panel and guide our discussion. Mark? Thanks, Linda. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our four distinguished panelists. Uh, well, first of all, I'll put my glasses on. Uh, beginning with Ambassador David Donahue, uh, former Ireland permanent representative to the United Nations, 2013 to 2017. Ambassador Donoghue was involved for many years in the Northern Ireland peace process and was one of the Irish government's negotiators for the groundbreaking Good Friday Agreement. I should also note his new book, One Good Day, is shot to the top of the book charts in Ireland. Uh, Brian Doherty is currently CEO with the Northwest Cultural Partnership, a collaborative group for six cultural organizations who work extensively across the derry Strabane District Council area the province and cross border in Northern Ireland. Uh, Martin J. Burke, professor of history and American studies at Lehman College and the Graduate Center, the City University of New York, director of the CUNY Institute of Irish American St uh, Studies, 
a junior fellow at the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, and John Waters, Clinical Associate Professor of English and of Irish Studies at New York University. He served as founding director of the Interdisciplinary MA in Irish and Irish American Studies at Glucksman Ireland House, where he regularly teaches classes on James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, and on writing The Troubles. Uh, so we're going to begin with uh, Ambassador uh, David Donoghue. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, in the time available, I'll try to just give a very quick overview of what the Good Friday Agreement uh, set out to achieve, how we got there. Um, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to be trapped in that building you'd have seen on the movie, uh, Castle Buildings, the one uh, which looks like a kind of a, a, a jailhouse. I was trapped there for several years and uh, while we had the earlier negotiations and then finally we had the dramatic week leading up to, to Good Friday. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for the product placement, Mark. And out of that, I wrote a, a little book a, a couple of months ago, uh, which tries to give an account of those uh, negotiations. But I will also look at where uh, the agreement is going, what, what its future is, what could arise from it. The first thing to say is that it is one of the very few examples of successful conflict resolution anywhere in the world. So for that reason, among others, the likes of Monica McWilliams and others whom you saw in the, in the movie are uh, in great demand as speakers at conferences all over the world because the Good Friday Agreement is, is really, uh, I won't say it's a model for conflict resolution, but it certainly has stood the test of time. Um, the, in the early 90s, the, the first thought I wanted to leave with you is we, we had er, earlier on looked at approaches to, the, uh, to, to ending the troubles in Northern Ireland, which would involve just a small selection of political parties. Uh, and that gradually, we, we gradually realized that that was not going to work. We were only going to get a stable and lasting peace settlement in Northern Ireland if we had everybody at the table, but on the basis of a total commitment to peace. So that, that really meant we, we wanted not only to have the moderate Nationalist Party and the moderate Unionist Parties, but we also felt that we had to have those at either end of the spectrum, namely Sinn Féin on the Nationalist or Republican side, who had been supporting IRA violence. We, needed to, we wanted to have them at the table, and we also wanted to have the loyalist parties who were uh, close to loyalist paramilitary groups. As I say, we wanted to have them all at the table because otherwise the agreement would probably collapse. So we had to have an inclusive process, an inclusive agreement. But the admission ticket was a, a complete commitment to peaceful politics, that was the basis with which we began to work in the early 90s. And there were two key documents which perhaps have been mentioned earlier today. One was called the Downing Street Declaration of 1993. And uh, the, the point, and another one was called the Framework Document. Those two documents, frankly, provided a framework within which um, Sinn Féin and the IRA could together decide that um, th there was a prospect of achieving their goals by peaceful political means and by no longer relying on violence. We, as the Irish government, were trying to persuade uh, the Republican movement, which is the term used for Sinn Féin and the IRA together, we were trying to persuade the Republican movement that, th that they should commit themselves to the political route they did that eventually, but on the basis of the Downing Street Declaration in particular, which uh, I don't have time to go into it now, but which showed them that it was that, 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 that if you like, their aspirations would be given equal weight with those of unionism. The IRA ceasefire followed eight months after the Downing Street Declaration, so in August 19, 1994. It lasted, to, it was the first, turned out to be the first ceasefire. We thought that it would be the one and only ceasefire, but um, an issue arose again, I can only touch on it briefly the so called decommissioning of weapons. What to do with the weapons which, which 
terrorist or paramilitary groups were no longer using. In a word, the unionists insisted that these weapons should be handed over in advance of talks, uh, whereas the IRA said they had not been defeated in a military sense. Um, they, they, they therefore had volunteered a ceasefire and they didn't see why they should have to come in with their hands up, as it were. So there was a certain logic or validity in both points of view, but it meant that there was a permanent confrontation between those points of view, the IRA would not hand over weapons and nor would um, the, the, the loyalist groups. Uh, the unions insist on that. So that meant that confidence in the political negotiations began to ebb away. Uh, and finally then the IRA ceasefire collapsed in early 96 and we had another difficult year. Uh, it's the year actually referred to the beginning of the of the movie about the women's coalition with a difficult year where Sinn Féin were once again out of the, they were excluded from the talks because the IRA had gone back to their campaign. Finally in the summer of 1997, a number of positive things happened. Uh, election of a British Prime Minister with a huge parliamentary majority, that, that, that Tony Blair, that gave, uh, that gave us some room for manoeuvre because somebody with a huge majority would be able to take political risks. The election also in the same year, same summer of a new Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern, who also had a stable majority and who had already uh, struck up a contact with Blair while they were both in opposition. The two of them were pragmatic types without any ideological baggage. They wanted a deal, so that was actually a fortunate development. Along with that, you had Bill Clinton in Washington as a highly informed and highly uh, engaged third partners were. The three of them were together, kind of confidence building factor. Next thing is the IRA ceasefire is resumed or renewed as of um, July 1997. That meant that we got to the inclusive talks once again in September, October of 97. I'm almost there, by the way, only another few months to Good Friday. Um, and then what happened was, and some of this was shown in the movie, uh, two of the unionist parties walked out because they didn't want to be sitting at the table with Sinn Féin. But, uh, crucially, David Trimble, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, decided to stay in the talks. That meant that we had, as it were, a critical mass of, of parties. If he had gone, there would have been no talks, there would have been no agreement. We then had six months or so in which almost nothing happened. It, after, after the talks had finally been uh, launched in September, October 97, they got nowhere. And it wasn't really until about March of 1998, a month before Good Friday, that finally things began to happen. One key factor was that George Mitchell, the chairman of the talks, set a deadline, as, you, as you'll see in the movie, in conjunction with the two governments, and that deadline was for Holy Thursday. It was the, actually the 9th of April in that particular year. We, we slipped into the following day, the 10th of April, Friday the 10th of April, but it was only one, one day late. And the, the key thing was that Mitchell setting a deadline concentrated the minds of everybody. It didn't make the difficulties any less. I mean, we, we, we still had uh, several nights of, uh, several days and nights of extremely hard bargaining and near walkouts and so on. But finally, by Good Friday, we got the whole thing together. That's probably uh, as much as I can say uh, about the past. For the future, um, the Good Friday Agreement is not perfect. It's nowhere near perfect. There are some, there are flaws in it which we knew at the time. One was, and one, this was absolutely unavoidable, the language on the so-called decommissioning, the disposal of weapons, was deliberately fudged because we would not have been able to get all the parties to agree to it. it. It could never be as precise and as specific as the unions wanted. The, the, the Sinn Féin need, needed it to be fairly uh, loose and unbinding. The result was a fudge. I knew at the time, so did others, that one day David Trimble would have trouble within his own party, within the Unis party, because it was not promising weapons, uh, the, the, the disposal of weapons in the near future. In fact, 
it, it took until 2005 before the issue of weapons was finally uh, resolved. So that's seven years after the agreement uh, came in. So that was one flaw to begin with. Another one was that uh, we kicked a number of issues down the road we, because we would not have been able to reach consensus on them in those negotiations. One big success, though, was that the transition uh, was the creation of a new police force. It had previously been called the Royal Ulster Constabulary with a 90% uh, Protestant majority, as you may have seen. But uh, a new police force was, was eventually agreed some years later called the Police Service of Northern Ireland, which is a, a much more neutral in terms of ethnic background or religious background. And so that is one of the bigger successes. A, a, a failure is that not every group in Northern Ireland feels that it has had the benefits of the agreement, and in particular, what I might call working class loyalism. That's to say, you know, it, the unionist community, but at, at the kind of grassroots level, they feel that they did not benefit. Um, and that, you know, it, that, that means that sectarianism, as in uh, um, how would one describe it, that behavior where one religion is, uh, one uh, part of the community is, is uh, punishing another, uh, more or less uh, uh, in terms of, 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 of violence and uh, denial of, of economic opportunities. The sectarianism is still rampant in various parts of Northern Ireland. So the, the, that's an example of the successes, but also the, the failures. I suppose a big issue, this is my last sentence, a big issue is will a united Ireland uh, now uh, loom up as a possibility given Brexit, given the, the trauma caused by Brexit? The Good Friday Agreement allows for the holding of a referendum on the issue of Irish unity or uh, maintenance of the union with Britain. Um, my feeling is that that decision, or that, that that referendum will not be convened until a point where the two governments, and I emphasise the two governments, roughly speaking, know what is likely, to, uh, how, how the question is likely to be answered. We're not going to have a referendum at a, at a time when the outcome might be uncertain. Uh, my, my guess is it will be deferred until we both can reasonably guess that there will be a majority for Irish unity. And that is uh, several, well, it's anybody's guess, but a lot, of, a lot of preparations will be needed before we even get to, to um, that referendum. That's probably as much as I could do in the time available. Sorry, uh, Mark, but I'm delighted to answer any questions if we have time after. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Donoghue. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Brian Doherty. Okay. Uh, thank you, folks, for uh, being here. Thanks for the invite. I uh, learned on the hospitality, and I'm a CEO of the organization that's going to host uh, these wonderful students in, in Londonderry uh, in a few weeks' time, where hopefully you'll get a real sense of what it's like uh, on the ground. Because I suppose, from my perspective, I think that's the most important element. Uh, I'm not an academic, I'm not a politician, although I did try and finish a PhD at one point, but never got around to it. Uh, but I've been a practitioner uh, in the community sector in Derry now for 25 years. I was born in the city uh, in 1968, uh, and I've worked primarily or almost entirely within the Protestant Unionist Loyalist uh, community. And that context, I think, is really important. You know, if, if we want to reflect on uh, how the Good Friday Agreement evolved uh, and how, it's, how it transpired and where it might go in the future, I think the, the perspective and context of, of someone like myself uh, is, is important to, to try to understand. I, uh, without going into it in too much detail, uh, I grew up uh, within a a loyalist community, although my family weren't extreme loyalist, they were more royalist than, than loyalist. Uh, uh, we had members who fought in the uh, family, fought in both world wars. I had uh, brothers who fought for the, or who were members of the Ulster Defence Regiment, which was the local uh, British Army, and of nephews and nieces who are, who are currently 
uh, serve in, in, in the Allied forces as well. Which is an important context whenever people ask of the, the insistence on sense of identity and, and sovereignty. If, if, if you've come from a family that's given their life to their country, which I think most Americans understand, then obviously that's embedded, becomes embedded in your DNA. Derry is very different. Uh, being a Protestant in Derry is very different from being uh, a Protestant across Northern Ireland, whereas uh, the majority of, of, of the population in Northern Ireland uh, are pro-union, although that figure is obviously changing. It has been that case for 100 years. That's why the country survived 100 years. It's because of democracy. In Derry, though, uh, the unionist community are very much in the minority. It's very much a national city. It's a city where the birth of the, the civil rights movement, as you've seen there. It's a city of John Hume. It's a city of Martin McGuinness. You know, so it's very much been seen, the birth of the SDLP party as well. So uh, it sees itself, it's very comfortable in its own skin as being a, a nationalist uh, uh, city. But a unionist in that city isn't as comfortable. Uh, when you consider that Derry, although... Uh, it is kind of a famous city, is largely where it's placed geographically, uh, right in the, the northwest tip of Ireland. It sees itself as peripheral to almost everything and everyone. It's peripheral to the power bases in Belfast, the power base in Dublin, the power base in London and in Europe uh, as well. Uh, so we really are uh, on the periphery of the periphery uh, in that respect. And that's kind of created the psyche of, of us against the rest of the world that you've seen uh, emerge from, uh, from Derry and London Derry. Uh, after Bloody Sunday, the vast majority of Protestants in the city uh, were forced out into the periphery again, the periphery of, of, of the city. Uh, so if, if you are, are even further uh, marginalised and you can understand how someone like myself grows up with a pretty negative attitude towards, uh, towards nationalism uh, in, in many respects. So I, I, I've spent my life, I suppose, uh, despite having two years at University in Manchester, uh, I very consciously came back to, to, to work in the community because I'm a socialist at heart uh, and I'm a community worker at heart. Uh, and I felt that there was a, a, a body of work that needed to be done in terms of, of respect for diversity and parity of esteem within the unionist community in Derry, which is ironic given the fact that uh, civil rights uh, were, the civil rights movement kicked off in Derry uh, fighting for the rights of, of nationalists. Uh, so in the lead up, I suppose, w w within that context, I have been working primarily with uh, a number of, of, of organisations which are largely civic-based. Uh, civic uh, I uh, started in 1995 in the lead up actually to the, to the uh, kind of construction of the Good Friday Agreement which my colleagues have, have, have outlined. At that time, uh, I think we were all ready for it, uh, although I was a very proud Briton. I think everyone and in, 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 in right across the board were, were ready for an end to this. We were sick and tired of it. I know there was many reasons given as to why we were tired. There's hundreds you could, you, that you could give. Uh, largely, I think it was because there was a stalemate that had been reached. Unionist, uh, the unionist slaughter or the loyalist slaughter had become every bit as grotesque as the IRA slaughter. Uh, I think Grey Steel, for example, happening a week after... Uh, the Shankill bombing uh, in Belfast, I think, kind of started that move towards uh, enough uh, is enough. It hasn't also been it hasn't been mentioned. It's my belief as well that uh, the IRA surrendered largely because they were infiltrated with uh, informers, and I think the, the, that's starting to to emerge now. So I think there's a point where even the protagonists and, and the the creators of the violence had realised that, that they'd reached uh, a stalemate. So by 1998, we were ready for it. And when it happened with 70.12% uh, success rate, I think we were all delighted and relieved. There was a honeymoon period, no doubt about it, uh, from uh, 2008, uh, uh, sorry, from 1998 to 2000, maybe mid-2000s, there was certainly a real energy and thirst and excitement about engaging. It was trendy to engage. It was trendy to to work with their Catholic navies neighbours, it was trendy uh, to, to go into areas you hadn't been felt you hadn't felt safe in before. A couple of the institutions that came out of the Good Friday Agreement, I was I was involved in. I was a, a member of the Northern Ireland Civic Forum uh, when it first started, the highly unsuccessful Civic Forum, which for reasons I could go into on a different day. 
but I was also uh, appointed an independent member of the very first inaugural Northern Ireland Policing Board, which, as uh, David indicated, was successful, you know, highly successful in terms of kind of physical evidence of, 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 of that uh, transformation. Not perfect by any means, but highly successful uh, in any respect. So what I did, I mean, what we found as I kind of progressed through my career as a community worker was how important I think uh, the civic voice uh, had become, or how, how important the civic voice uh, is. I, 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 I'm not a great believer in, in mainstream politics. I, I tend to believe that politics is overrated, uh, particularly politics in Northern Ireland, which has become uh, kind of uh, embedded in, in uh, you know, elements of institutions which aren't simply, I don't believe, are, are, are workable. Uh, that was a challenge after the honeymoon period and I think remains a challenge uh, going forward. I think we, we need a, a full uh, transformation and reformation of, of, of how the, uh, those democratic institutions uh, work. So I, I became more involved in, in, in being that civic voice. Uh, the current uh, organisation I work for now is actually quite unique. Uh, it's quite unique not only in Derry, but quite unique, uh, as we're finding uh, across Northern Ireland and, and uh, even abroad, as we see, because what it does is it promotes progressive unionism. It shows that there is uh, a lot of uh, intelligent thinkers and smart leaders within unionism and within civic unionism. The, the, the likes that probably haven't been seen uh, since David Irvine, uh, he, he was in, in the, uh, well known as part of the negotiations uh, as well. It's there, uh, but it's, it's uh, under the surface, and it's been oppressed by, I think, political uh, unionism. So what we uh, try and do in our organisation is we use the, the networks that already exist, that, that get, a, get us ready access to the most marginalised uh, uh, young Protestants in Northern Ireland. As was, was quite rightly said, the biggest threat to peace going forward is... Uh, the, the sense, still that sense of a peace dividend not having reached its way down to, to grassroots uh, working class communities. And that's the same within republicanism uh, as well. So what, so, what, so what we do is we, uh, we work with a, a constituent base that primarily, largely, locally and internationally had been demonised, which is the, the, the March and Bands community, uh, which I'm sure you've seen in, uh, in press, which is usually guys beating the drum as hard as they can behind people in sashes and, and involved in riots, because that's usually the, the international narrative that still uh, pertains, but the reality is very different. Most of those loyalist estates that the Protestants were forced into in Derry, for example, have a loyalist band. Uh, the band is the core of, of that community. Uh, the young people who may have been attracted to antisocial behaviour or to paramilitary activity are in that band. The main influencer is the band leader, not the politician, not the youth worker, not the, the church leader, not the community worker, but the band leader. Uh, uh, most small estates would have a band of maybe 100 membership, of which at least 60% are young people under the age of 25, young people who are low uh, educational attainers and, as I say, most susceptible to, to violence. We, we have worked out that by working with those band leaders, you have already made a group of, of, of individuals who want to change. They, they, want, they, they hate the demonization of their, their, their musicianship. They hate the demonization of their culture. They were ready for change. Uh, so what we have done in the last 10 years has been hugely successful in, in, in bringing those leaders together, not only within the band's community now, but within all forms of Ulster Scots and pro-British culture, including drama, highland dance, uh, heritage and, 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 and language uh, as well. They've been hugely successful, not that you would ever hear in, in the mainstream media. Uh, we had we got five loyalist bands, for example, to play at the Fla Flag Call in the Hearn, which is a major musical uh, production in 2013 in Derry, much to the delight of, of Mark McGuinness, nonetheless. We developed a, a parading protocol called the Maiden City Accord, which brought together all the stakeholders involved in parading uh, in the city and, and basically resolved the parading issue in, in, in Northern Ireland. We're looking to, to, to move that model uh, uh, across Northern Ireland uh, as well. We were involved in research where we, we, as well as having our ear to the ground, we, uh, we, we like to back that up with uh, empirical evidence as well. Because, and I'll finish on this point. Uh, because the institutions have been uh, suspended 
uh, for the last two, three years. I kind of lose count because it's actually been nine out of 25 that they haven't been in operation. That civic voice has been allowed to grow and emerge. It's been a, it's been a silver lining for us uh, because uh, we have been able to na uh, navigate civic structures and, and, and policy structures ourselves without the, the, the negative influence of political unionism. It's also allowed us to have the ear of both the, the British government and the Irish governments uh, to a point where we're strongly influencing uh, policy as it stands. We've had major presentations in the current cultural legislation going through Westminster at the moment and we've also contributed very significantly to New Decade, New Approach uh, and recently the Windsor Framework. So it's actually been a benefit to us and it may not sound uh, perfect but it's allowed us to, to as I say, plough that line straight to, to the powers that be, largely because the, the political parties aren't getting any response from political unionism. Uh, so in, in that respect it, 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 it's been uh, to the benefit. There are many challenges. I, I think we uh, and I may, I may go in further to this in the, the question, but there are we are at probably, I feel, the most volatile uh, and sensitive period in my lifetime since 1998. I think we're, uh, there's a real danger of, of, of uh, a significant form of civic instability coming back in, into society in Northern Ireland. Uh, the, it's happened already within republicanism. Uh, you, you're starting to see kind of more extreme levels of violence. Oh, my challenge as a community worker working with unloyalism is that that, uh, that disenfranchised third tier, as we call it, grassroots tier, don't get to the same level of, of, dis, uh, of disillusion that they resort to, to lawless violence uh, as well. Uh, and there's many reasons why I think we, we how, how, that, how that can be resolved. And our work, I think, uh, helps to, to, to do that. There's 600, one final point, there's 660, what people don't realise, and I think I mentioned these figures earlier on today, how that constituent base can be so influential is the fact that in, within the bands community, for example, there are 664 loyalist bands in Northern Ireland of a population of 1.8 million. Uh, 30,000 bandsmen and women, 30,000, that's 30,000 musicians. It's the largest cultural movement in Western Europe. And uh, I, I've always wondered why it's taken a group, a small group of, of volunteers like ourselves to realise how vital and how important it is to work with that constituent base. Uh, so hopefully uh, we, we can continue to do that uh, moving forward. So I'm going to end there now, but if there's anyone that wants to, to, me to expand on any element uh, afterwards, I'm sure we'll get a chance. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Brian Doherty. Uh, and uh, our next speaker will be uh, Martin J. Burke. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank Linda and the other organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to spend the morning, afternoon, and hopefully late evening, both with students and with figures I admire, especially the ambassador. Let me open up with a remark by Tony Blair on that April 10th, in which he referred to the burden of history being lifted from the shoulders. I'm going to use his comment as a point of departure, not to talk about the burdens of history, but perhaps the burdens of historians. That is to say, how do historians look in a relatively short framework at the successes of the Good Friday Agreements and some of the limitations and perhaps its prospects? The first historian's comment I have is from a, my perch as a practicing historian of American history. The intervention of the Clinton administration starting a little before 1896, but certainly made public in the Guildhall in Derry, where you'll be soon, and certainly amplified with the appointment of George Mitchell, did mark a break in the participation of U.S. presidents in the history of Ireland and Northern Ireland. True, John Adams was interested in rounding up Irish rebels with the Alien and Sedition Acts. True, the Fenians did invade Canada, vexing Andrew Johnson if he paid any attention in 1866 and 1867. Woodrow Wilson was quite adamant in his lack of interest in Eamon de Valera and inviting any representatives of the Irish rebels, the Irish Republic, to either the tables at Versailles or to conversations in Washington. 
And Franklin Roosevelt sent over 300,000 American troops to Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I believe it's the largest military presence ever on the history of, history of Ireland, domestic or foreign. But in the wake of the Second World War, issues in Northern Ireland were treated in Washington primarily in terms of private and public British matters, not part of the portfolio of the United States. We heard earlier today from Ted about how that began to change in the 1970s and 1980s with figures like Mario Biaggi and Tip O'Neill in Congress, Hugh Carey, Ted Kennedy, and Pat Moynihan in the U.S. Senate. But it is the Clinton administration that really changes things. And the presence of the United States not there, as George Mitchell told us, with the peace plan. The U.S. was all across the world in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s with prearranged peace plans, but the U.S. as an honest broker and as a catalyst marked a fundamental departure and an historic one for the diplomatic and political history of the United States. Moving to my other guys and being an occasional historian of Ireland, what were some of the effects of the Good Friday Agreement? Pardon the alliteration, but I'm going to go through a number of Ps. First and foremost, peace. The long struggle that had killed over 3,500 people and wounded over 50,000 people came to an end. Did not come to an end on April 10th, 1998, but it soon would. The process of decommissioning, demilitarizing that David told us about was successful, and it is hard to imagine here on this dais in 2023 that while sectarian violence might yet again raise its ugly head in either communities, that any attempt at an armed struggle to replace the political regime in the six counties with another one would be successful. Physical force republicanism, by and large, has given way from the Armalite to the ballot box. There it should stay, and if nothing else comes from the Good Friday Agreement, that was more than sufficient, a great accomplishment. Both David and Brian mentioned policing and the replacement of the Royal Ulster Constabulary with the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the beginning of a non-sectarian process of social order and social justice was fundamental and fundamental to the coherence and the future stability of any political arrangements in the North. Politics. Well, in terms of parliamentary politics, that building that we saw in the film and that you'll see when you go to Stormont, it was reopened. A power-sharing government was reintroduced, carefully worked out in those years of negotiation and in those heavy days for you of the winter and the spring of 1998. But as you just mentioned a moment ago, nine out of the last 25 years are ones in which the doors of Stormont have been closed. We heard this morning from Orit that the resources for reform of the current constitutional arrangements, that is to say the ones that lead to mandatory coalitions between the two largest parties. Those resources are there within the Good Friday Agreements. I would hope that is the case. But as someone sitting on this side of the water, it is not hard to see that before parliamentary politics with a functioning executive and a functioning Northern Ireland Assembly move forward, there's going to have to be changes made from what were lined out, hopefully, in 1998. 25 years and not functioning in those many of those years simply is not satisfactory. Politics at a more broad level, there I think we've seen the demise of the two main parties that brought together the Northern Ireland Accords, the SDLP and the 
official Unionist Party, the rise of the Democratic Unionist Party, openly opposed to the agreements, and the rise of Sinn Féin. But we've also seen of late, as Ora was mentioning again this morning, the return of a politics that identifies itself not necessarily as nationalist or not necessarily as unionist. It is the Alliance Party and the prospects of moving past hard identitarian politics and into a politics that might fall along more predictable and familiar left-right lines that strikes me here moving from my historian's role to a political scientific prognosticator is somewhere where we might see hope for change in the future. And then finally, in my lines of alliteration, prosperity. When the Northern Ireland state was established in 1921, the six counties were the richest part of the island of Ireland. Deindustrialization in the 1950s and 1960s, and then the outbreak of the Troubles in the late 60s and 70s would lead to Northern Ireland being the poorest part of the United Kingdom. And while the Good Friday Agreement looked primarily in matters political, constitutional, and legal, there was, was the hope for economic revitalization. That has been slow. And it has been challenged of late by Brexit. Brexit and the subsequent Northern Ireland Protocol and the more recent Windsor Framework does open the pros pros prospects, as Rishi Sunak has said of late, of Northern Ireland being a site of tremendous economic opportunity. I'm not sure. I'm an historian. I work in the past, not in the future. But without longer periods of sustained economic growth, and without the integration of those socially and economically marginalized Republican and loyalist communities that we've just heard about, it's hard to imagine stability moving on in a post-Brexit framework. Finally, let me run through three more letters, and here I'm going from my P's to my D's. Demography, Destiny, and Democracy. It was clear in 1998 that sometime in the not-too-distant future, a Republican nationalist majority would emerge, and a loyalist, unionist, then majority would become the minority. We're probably on the verge of that demographically, we're not there politically, and the rise of alliance may preclude, preclude, that, preclude that altogether. Sinn Féin will be, when Stormont reopens its doors, the largest political party. At the end of May, local elect, council elections will be held in Northern Ireland, and Sinn Féin may well arrive to be the largest party in the local councils as well. And it's not too difficult to imagine in the Irish Republic at the expense of both Fine Gael, Labour, and Fianna Foyle, of Sinn Féin being the largest party in the Irish Republic is in the future. If that is the case, the prospects of a peaceful transition as David was saying before, are ones that are going to be quite vexing and ones that will need, I would hope, to be discussed now. But one bit here of hope going back to our last film, and that's not just demography, but it is the distaff side of politics. The coronation of... Charles as the next king, not emperor of India anymore, um, will include representatives of both Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, and the representative of Northern Ireland will be 
the first minister-designate, Michelle O'Neill. So the head of Sinn Féin right now, Mary Lou MacDonald, a woman. The next first minister of Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill, a woman. The issue of women in Ireland's politics in the post-Good Friday Agreement politics coming out of the film we saw before and the questions you posed to us, I think are, are ones that are very hopeful. And so while I wouldn't bet my future, short as that might be, on happiness, I'm not Irish, but I'm an American of Irish descent, and things can always go wrong. Prospects certainly look better 25 years out. And the hard work, the goodwill, the achievement of David's generation is being passed on to another generation that you, the next generation, need to both in integrate, interrogate, and make your own. Okay, thank you, Professor Burke. Uh, our final speaker in this session is Professor John Waters. <clears throat> it's always tough going last. <laughs> so much has been said, so much is worth saying. Thanks to Linda for inviting me. Thanks for my the other panelists for being here. Um, so I'm a professor of, uh, of Irish studies and of Irish literature, and I'm, <clears throat> what I'm going to speak about uh, it, today is, is based partly just on the career that I've had as someone who teaches uh, Irish studies and Irish literature um, over the course of my career. So I first, I want to begin by by putting before you a concept about the complex temporality of, of the events that we're discussing, right? So we're talking about the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which came at the end of what's known in, in Irish studies and in Irish culture as the decade of centenaries, right? So this is a, has been a, a, a very significant period of public and academic discussion about the, the extraordinarily tumultuous and complicated events that began in 1912 and that ran through 1922 and 1923. And we're coming to the end of that just at this moment where, as my, my panelists have discussed, the question of the peace process in Northern Ireland has reached this milestone event in 25 years, but also this moment of sort of fractiousness. And so what I want to begin with first is suggesting to you that the question of the troubles Right, has always had a very complicated and indeed unstable temporality to it. Right? So what do I mean by that notion of an unstable temporality? Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the question of, of teaching in a minute. But the question partly is, like, when did the troubles begin? Right? Um, and if you're teaching a course on writing the troubles, as I've done many times, the question of when did the troubles begin, uh, it always brings me back to a, to a comment of my colleague, Professor Joe Lee, um, when I asked what he taught one particular day, he said, oh, I had a very successful class. I was teaching about 1916, and I, got, um, I started with 1916, and I got as far as uh, 1798. <laughs> right? and, and so the, the, regressive, the regressive nature of trying to find historical origin points and thinking also about the idea of the troubles as an event, right? Um, and it's an event of a, with a very complex temporality that reaches back in time and it reaches up in, into the present. Um, and that's compounded by, by Brexit. And, and so uh, much of my thinking and my teaching in, in, at the moment has been centered on the way in which the, this larger question of writing the troubles that I've been grappling with, as I'll say in a second, for, for quite a long time, for most of my career as an academic, um, is, is especially compounded by Brexit. Brexit seemed to be an event, right? It seemed to be something that happened in 2016. And for my sins, uh, I was asked by a young filmmaker who I wanted to help out if I would agree to do an on-camera interview about Brexit at the end of 2016. And I said yes, and I was filmed talking knowledgeably, relatively, about Brexit in 2016. Um, the film is not finished. It's seven years later. Young people take time. They've got to raise money. They've got a lot to do. Um, and it's evolved. Like, obviously, Brexit was not an event. Brexit is a process. Brexit is something very unstable, very new, very hard to predict, um, very much evolving over time. It's, it's like uh, squeezing jello in terms of trying to find the content of what Brexit is and what it means. The people who, in fact, proposed it didn't know what it meant. 
Um, and in fact, it was a kind of a nightmare that they, th- they hoped that they didn't have, and then it turned out they did have it, right? Um, what's the relationship between these two, and how does this relate to, to sort of where we are at the moment? I've been teaching a course, um, and for the students, we faculty do this. We reteach things. We, we rely on the fact that we know something because we've already taught it. Um, but I, I first taught a course on writing the troubles when I was a graduate student at Duke University. And that was partly just based on the fact that I went to Trinity College in Dublin and I did a degree there in the mid 80s. Um, and I got grabbed. I went to Ireland because I got grabbed by Seamus Heaney and by, by Irish poetry, by Yeats and by Joyce. Um, and then when I went to Dublin, I discovered this poet from Northern Ireland named Paul Muldoon, who was very young at the time, and he published a few books. And he tore my head open. Like he'd, he'd, there was no one as exciting or as difficult or as challenging or as electrifying or as sophisticated or as elusive uh, that I'd ever encountered as Muldoon. So I wrote a thesis about Muldoon. Then I went on to do my PhD, and there was a place where I could teach a course. And... Uh, Happenstance, I met a girl in Belfast, and in, in, sorry, in uh, Dublin in 86, who was a nurse at the RVH, the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. And I started going up weekends in 1986 and 1987 to Belfast during the Troubles. And for the most part, I stayed around Queens, and it was a safe, leafy area where the student bars were, and it was incredibly fun, like really great time to be young, and uh, you didn't sort of think about other things you were seeing. And I had some... Um, in-law relatives uh, to my, my brothers in laws who were out in West Belfast and I you know I got to know the ground a little bit just a little bit um, enough so that I started teaching a class in 1992 at Duke it's 31 years later and I'm still teaching the same class writing the troubles um, and obviously I teach it differently and and partly that's that's a question of of knowledge and of learning uh, and the evolution of the of the subject matter right because one of the things about the literature produced in Northern Ireland is the question of scale. Uh, I ran a job search in the late 1990s when I was teaching at Notre Dame, where I taught this Writing the Troubles class after teaching it at Duke. And uh, we were looking for an assistant professor of British poetry. Um, There were 130 applications for an assistant professorship in the field. And we noticed that an alarming percentage of them were about Irish poetry. And so we did a little bit of research, right? And in terms of the PhD dissertations written in the previous 50 years about poetry from Britain, right? more than 50% were written about Northern Ireland. Right? So you have a, a population of six or 700,000 people um, as opposed to 70 million people. And you have the academic study of the poetry and the, that where it's almost equivalent in terms of those populations. So, Something really powerful happened during the Troubles in terms of the production of an extraordinary literature, right? And it's, uh, the explanations for that lie really in the Labor government in 1948 when the Butler Education Act was passed and education was opened up in Northern Ireland and you had this pent-up demand for education that led to a whole lot of talented people getting a, sh- a chance, getting a shot. And you had secondary schools of real rigor like St. Columns and Derry that produced four Nobel Prize winners Right? An astonishing small school right, in, uh, in Derry that has four graduates who have won Nobel Prizes. Um, but it was also the case that, that this happened broadly in both communities, right? in Protestant and, and Catholic communities, that the creative output in beginning in the, in the late 50s, early 1960s, all the way up through the present, as I'll say in a moment, was outside the scale. Right? Something, something profound had happened. And the relationship of that to civil conflict to cultural instability is not direct. It is not the case that the, that social breakdown produced this extraordinary literature. It's far more complicated than that. And if you want to know a little bit more of that, you can take um, the class. I teach it regularly, as I've, I've already told you. Um, but uh, that, that scale of, of the question of, of the production of an imaginative literature across poetry, drama, and um, and fiction was also matched by the scale of the social science literature. And so the Troubles in Northern Ireland has a bibliography uh, that extends literally into the thousands of pages. And so this is one of the most studied places in the world, and it, both in terms of civil society, in terms of governance, in terms of ideology, in terms of religion. 
People have tried to crack the nut of why this prob why the problems endured and how it is that the problems were at at some level uh, changed or transformed in relationship to um, the peace process. And so, uh, one of the one of the ways in which that this question of Northern Ireland and its uh, transformation in the process after the Good Friday Agreement has become especially interesting in the context of teaching a course on writing the Troubles is in relationship to the border, right? So when I was traveling up, uh, and, and my panel so all know this, and those of you who were traveling back in that time would know, going between the, the Republic and the north of, of Ireland or Northern Ireland was to go through a militarized border, right? And I'd never had a machine gun pointed at me sort of rolling in with two girls in the front seat and the yank in the back and the young 19-year-old British soldier puts his gun on the top of the window as it rolls down, smiling, but points the gun inside the car for his own safety while your license plate is being read out. Um, that border was a manifestation of the transformation of politics in Ireland in the, in the early 20th century that was maintained all the way up through the post-Good Friday Agreement. And there's a book that came out in 2016 that I, that I use quite a bit now in my graduate classes called The Theory of the Border by a guy named Thomas Nails, who works primarily on the Mexican border. But he, he makes an argument that I want to suggest you might, we might want to think about a little bit, which is that uh, states don't produce borders, borders produce states. Nails argues that, in fact, it is, that it is the process of, of bordering what he calls a kinopolitics, a dynamics of the transformation of the movement of bodies, the movement of people in space, that creates the possibility of a stable state. And one of the things that happened with the Good Friday Agreement, the post-Good Friday Agreement, is the border was taken down. Right? And there's, it's now an archaeologist's visit to the border area to say that's where the gun emplacements were, that's where the tanks you know, were sitting, where the, the armored person. The disappearance of the border is an outward manifestation of a, of a profound transformation, I think, on the island of Ireland that no one wants, to, well, I can't say that no one wants to go back to a hard border because there is a small constituency who have the dream of the idea of erecting a border again. Right, who have the idea that, that the state of Northern Ireland should have a border. It should be separate from the Republic. It should manifest itself that way. And yet that's a minority, very much a minority um, uh, opinion. Um, and that leads me to, to the last few remarks I want to make, which is about the intergenerational relations between writing in the 1970s, 80s, into the 90s, early 2000s. And the emergence of what I would argue is now a kind of, uh, of a new Irish renaissance in writing from Northern Ireland. And it's what you might call Queen's Lit, right? Queen's University uh, established the Seamus Heaney Center uh, for Creative Writing in 2004, 2003. 2003, because it's the 20th anniversary of the establishment of it. And they appointed Kieran Carson, the, the great writer from Belfast, to be the first Seamus Heaney professor. And they stood up a creative writing program that had a small one before. At the same time that they stood up the Mitchell Institute, and at the same time that Queens, with George Mitchell as chancellor, now Hillary Clinton as chancellor, with a few other Americans in between, that Queens has grown really dramatically as a university. And the Good Friday Agreement conference last week I, I secured my understanding of Queens as a world-class university. They couldn't have put on the kind of conference that, that some of us were lucky enough to be at last week without incredible vision and, and coordination and intelligence. But at the same time that uh, that, that conference was happening, a new book had been recently been published called Close to, Home, Close to Home by Michael McGee. And that joined a book called Trespasses by uh, Louise Kennedy. And these are two young writers publishing their first novel about this, this question of, of the troubles, right? Or what I call the half-life of the troubles. And it goes back to where I began, which is the question of what is the temporality of a complex event that might also be, be seen to be a process? And how can we think about what the peace process has meant for writing in Northern Ireland? And what I want to suggest to you is that we haven't yet begun to understand the Troubles, that it's actually the second generation, the people who have grown up after the Troubles, who have, whose sensitivity to their parents, to their aunts and uncles, to their childhood memories and for many of them, but also to their attempt to understand the psychic life that they grew up around, right? The, the, the psychic life where every man above a certain age has the same nightmare. 
right, of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and something terrible happened, where everybody understood what violence meant somatically and physically. And now that has to be understood intellectually. And what it's producing in the crucible of a world-class creative writing program and a tradition of realizing that the, that the literary and intellectual inheritance of Ireland and of the north of Ireland is so remarkable right, and so deep um, that we're finding an entire new generation of voices is coming out and we haven't yet begun to see or to understand the troubles as well as I think that we're going to. I'll leave it there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Professor Waters. Uh, we have some time for questions from the floor now. Can I, can I say one more thing? Um, uh, you mentioned that David's uh, book, One Good Day, is out. Um, but I also want to point to, if you're uh, interested in getting really a brilliant little conversation about, sorry, David, put you on the spot here, but uh, David and Tim Collins, who was a, a, a fellow negotiator from uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ireland, did a conversation at a podcast for, through the Royal Irish Academy that you can find on the Royal Irish Academy's website. It's about an hour and 15 minutes, but it is a, it's a very lively and very informative conversation about the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process. So, Thanks, sir. Yeah. Questions from the floor? who was a, uh, the founder of Irish Studies, Greg Maney, uh, here from Hofstra. So, um, so this is sort of a, a bookend for us at this, at this yeah. critical juncture. So again, we're so grateful. So many diverse angles that we've heard today. This is uh, such an interesting panel because we're looking at not only the politics, but the cultural change and all of these other issues. Um, one question I had, and I hope I'm not the only one with questions here, but um, is the, the, the generational issue, um, which, you know, how differently do young people today think about these sectarian challenges? And, um, you know, I know Brian's working with working class young people, and, you know, you're talking, um, uh, John, about the... Uh, writing the the experience and the transformative experience of writing about the past and about the troubles, but um, I'm wondering um, if uh, if any of you feel that very strongly there is different ways of thinking about identity today that, without denying the cross sectarian histories and biographies, but also pointing towards some kind of, uh, I, I don't want to over-romanticize the process of becoming a global citizen, but I do feel that, and again, we could probably ask these young people, how, even though they're not you know, directly involved in this history, that impulse to transcend those, or, or maybe it's even to have multiple identities, but that are able to, in some ways, help mediate these sectarian conflicts. Can I? At least start off the uh, thanks very much for that dinner. Just uh, my own uh, observation recently uh, when we had a whole series of um, anniversary related programs, podcasts, interviews, and so on, you know, over the last month or so in Ireland, um, both parts of Ireland. My own observation is that. Uh, there were high levels of ignorance, which is entirely natural, among the young generation in Ireland about uh, the troubles as such. And some of it was actually quite startling. I mean, they did uh, uh, surveys of the um, how well-known certain individuals were or not well-known. And one of the, the more st startling things that I heard was that um, the... Uh, I think it was something like that 40% of young people in Ireland thought that the British Army were responsible for um, the troubles. Now, you know, the truth is the IRA and other 
uh, and, and law age groups, but the IRA in particular were responsible for by far the largest number of, of deaths. But it's interesting that somehow, um, you know, this uh, this this um, uh, inaccuracy has spread. So that is just an example of how there really is a, uh, a significant education need here I'm talking really about the Republic, you know, that's the, the surveys related to that. But um, they have just now put the, leave, the Good Friday Agreement onto the leaving certificate uh, syllabus. That's to say the, the school, um, the, the final certificate you get finishing secondary school in, 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 in the Republic. And you could, you know, you might as well say it, it should have happened earlier. But, but so I think really picking up on what you were saying, there is a lot of um, there are a lot of gaps in people's knowledge that need to be filled in, and it may take you know a generation before we have actually achieved that. I mean, if somebody is now thirty, then they effectively knew nothing about the uh, the troubles, and uh, thirty five even. Um, so that's a significant part of the electorate, and uh, you know my generation are dying out basically. So it means that uh, uh, it, one advantage of the recent um, uh, anniversary was to expose how how much, uh, as it were, um, uh, reacquaintance is, need, is needed with how the troubles. Uh, what they meant. I mean, John described very vividly, you know, the, the, the cross in the border in those days in the 80s, and now you, you know, you, 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 there is nothing telling you that you're entering Northern Ireland. I mean, and nor should there be. I mean, it is meant to be. The, 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 what was interesting in a way was that one, the, the Good Friday Agreement um, it, it was intended to make the border invisible, but unionists were were relaxed enough about that because they were focusing more on the practical benefits of closer cooperation between us. That's how uh, between the two parts. That's how they 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 understood it. So they were perhaps uneasy about the possible political uh, significance that might be read into closer cooperation. But they focused on the pragmatic benefits. So against that background. Even unionists are content that the border would not have been a sort of a visible security focused border as as used to be the case so um, um yeah, so I suppose really um, uh, the more that we can throw a light on how the troubles came about and how how and what eventually brought them to an end, the better uh Brian, you were looking again in there yeah, I mean. I'd like to comment on the thing around the border as well, uh, sh shortly, but I mean, in terms of your initial question, Linda, I mean, speaking and working quite a bit with young people in Northern Ireland, uh, yeah, they're the same as most young people around the world. They're led by practicality rather than, rather than ideology. Uh, they see themselves as global citizens now. They see themselves... Uh, as, as kind of fluid in terms of, of their identity. I mean, e even in the Northern Ireland census now, they talk about, they give you the options of, of being British, Irish or, or Northern Irish. Uh, many, even young people that would come from a unionist background have, have, have multiple identities and support for various elements of culture. E even myself, I mean, although I identify very strongly as a unionist, I'm a member of the an All-Ireland Cricket Board Association, which is cross-border, and there is Cricket Board. I support Ireland rugby, I uh, support Northern Ireland football team. I, I, I like Irish music. Young Catholics love British music. You know, so so that's very unfair, I think. You know, and and to to, to kind of label or, or, or box young people into to, to certain kind of uh, angles, and 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 the young people aren't willing to do it anymore anyway. You know, so thankfully they're. Uh, I, I can see that has been a real hope going forward that young people will will base their decisions on, on on what's best for them and their society and their family and the environment and everything else. I mean, whenever we do, any time we carry out uh, research at Newgate, we always ask the questions in terms of what young people say is their priorities and, and, and sovereignty, identity and culture come very low down their list. It's all the, the, the higher end stuff around the environment, around the impact on COVID. Mental health's a huge issue in, in Northern Ireland, particularly in Derry. So that, you know, allows that. And I'll give you one kind of practical example as well of how it kind of ties into to what I was saying earlier on in terms of the bands community, which, you know, was char you know, characterised generally historically as being quite uh, 
it can be quite narrow in terms of, of, of it being pro-union. My brother-in-law joined a, a loyalist band in Irish Street in Derry called the East Bank Protestant Boys because his best man at his wedding was shot dead by the IRA. So he, he joined it in the 90s for purely political reasons, you know, and, and, and to, to, to make a point and, and, and to have the opportunity to, 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 to state his sense of Britishness and, and loyalism. His uh, son, my nephew, is in the same band, but if you talk to him about politics, he scoffs, huffs and laughs at you and walks off. To him, being in the band is about the musicianship. He was, he's quite low educational, quite poor at school. This gave him the sense of confidence and identity. Uh, it was a camaraderie. It was getting away with, with his friends to, to band parades. It was uh, walking in a parade of thousands of people and being that celebrity for the day, waving at me, waving at his family, and giving him that sense of, you know, something kind of special uh, in his life. You know, so even within that context of, of, of something that's seen as culturally uh, one-sided, it's, it's changing, it's fluid, and it's changing, I think, for the better. Just a, a, kind of a, a points in kind of the border in, in Northern Ireland. I mean, I, Derry's... Uh, a border city. I travelled across the border quite a lot uh, when I was younger during the Troubles, largely because my granny was from Kelly Beggs in Donegal and I would have went, spent summers down there, ironically because my parents thought it was safer for me as a Protestant to be in Donegal than, than being in, in, in Derry. But uh, I think it's a point worth making that there was borders in the UK during that period going into Wales and going into Scotland, but they didn't have young fellows with Armalites. And the reason those young people were there, including probably my brother and others, was because the IRA had waged a, a, a bombing campaign in Northern Ireland and were using uh, the Republic of Ireland as a, a safe haven, where the Irish government weren't uh, proactive in, in, in stopping that happen. So it had to be there. It was out of necessity rather than because of... of, of, of and I think it's an important uh, context to, to, to put across. Let me just uh, follow up. We saw both, especially in the Dinosaurs film, but... This morning as well, uh, re references to segregation, and schooling is still voluntarily segregated in the North. I say voluntarily segregated. This is not Alabama in 1963, but members of the Roman Catholic former minority and now maybe majority uh, tend to go to schools that are under the supervision of the Catholic Church and members of the former majority and now maybe not majority anymore uh, tend to go to state schools. And f while this might not preclude socialization, for young children, for adolescents, their social worlds still fall under segregated lines. And while they may well consider themselves to be Irish or British or European, or Northern Irish, I wonder, and it's a question for Eric, I wonder uh, if it's not until you start seeing significant levels of intermarriage in the communities that you might start, you'll be start moving away from identitarian politics and identitarian social organizations. And Brian, I'm not sure about the last uh, census, but the intermarriage numbers are still, they're getting a little better, but yeah. not very high. And that falls along class lines as well, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it does, yeah. And I, I don't know if it's worth yeah. pointing out in, in terms of uh, segregation or segregated education. You know, I know it's, 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 it's an ironic issue and, and it's, a, it's a strange issue in Northern Ireland because I mean all, all the polls indicate that the vast majority, over 90%, support integrated education, but none of them actually carry through on it. And again, it goes back to that argument around practicality rather than ideology. ideology. Parents, although they may be broad-minded in their thinking, don't want their kids to be the guinea pig. Uh, uh, the, the other issue as well is that you know segregation in education starts in, at primary level and the communities are still segregated, uh, and most of the primary schools are based in communities. So kids, or so par kids, are naturally go to the primary school closest to them. And if they're in predominantly Protestant areas or Catholic areas, then the school is going to be the same. There's actually encouraging evidence uh, at secondary level of, of it happening more naturally anyway. And, and although there are kind of uh, you know assigned uh, integrated colleges, many of the, the the voluntary grammar schools and and the uh, 
kind of private schools are, are, are quite mixed. I, I'm, I was on the board of governors at Foyle on Derry College, which is a, quite a famous school, kind of the St. Columns College equivalent in Derry. Uh, and when I went there in the, the early 80s, there, there was only one other Catholic in my year. And I'm still friendly, friends with them, by the way, but it was only 2% Catholic, 98% Protestant. It's now 40% Catholic, 60% Protestant. And that didn't happen through any kind of forced policy. It happened uh, kind of naturally. So I think, I think encouragingly, it's happening at secondary level uh, anyway. A question from the floor here. Um, um, I had one question for Mr. Doherty and one for Mr. Donahue. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could speak, uh, Mr. Doherty, if you could speak to the kind of the changes you saw in the segregation. Obviously, there was less violence after, but the changes in segregation that you've seen over time, which you just kind of spoke on, but I was wondering if you could talk on the um, friendliness between the communities, because I know you've discussed with at least the Ireland group um, that you're from the city, but in a very... Um, Protestant area of the city when you're surrounded by Catholicism. Okay, the uh, it's yeah. I mean, whenever a a city is naturally divided because of population movements, and I think in the film as well, uh, May Blood talked about you know the the forced exodus in, in Belfast and, and 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 so on. It's very difficult. It takes generations for that to change, and it takes money for that to change. It takes the economy to improve for that to change. There are uh, examples of a change in the wind dairy. Is, is when, when you come over here, you'll find that out. And it's, it's happened for uh, kind of one reason primarily, I think, and that's because the, the physical infrastructure in the city has allowed for greater integration. Uh, most young Catholics and Protestants now do mix in the same bars in Derry. Uh, there was a, the Peace Bridge was built 20 years ago, which completely opened up the whole city, which was segregated naturally by a river uh, as well, which didn't help. You know, so it's happened in uh, kind of naturally as well, but it'll only happen if people feel safe. And uh, I think, uh, as I was indicating earlier on, young people are starting to to feel much safer. Young, uh, I mean, that young my, my nephew who uh, I was referring to, you know, plays in the band. He, he plays uh, the drums in, in the band, the, the the marching band. But at the weekend, he goes to a place called the Nerve Center in the city center, which trains up young musicians, and he's Catholic friends in that band and he plays pop music in a band. You know, so to him it's about the music, not the uh, the, the, the context or the political uh, connotations. You know, and, and whenever you have a safe city you'll, you'll start to see that integration happening na more naturally anyway. And, and uh, w there are, e economically as well, uh, there are more uh, private housing developments being built across Northern Ireland which are naturally integrated uh, anyway. The social housing still remains segregated, uh, or the projects as they're called. I think over here, and then employment is the other key key variable. Uh, there has been a bit of a peace dividend. Uh, John Hume was very successful in bringing, for example, Seagate to 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 Derry, uh, and they have a very good policy. And Dupont, who, who've been there traditionally as well, have been have a very very strong proactive policy in terms of of fifty fifty recruitment. Uh, uh, so once they get the Protestants and Catholics in the the working environment, they also have a very strong and generous social kind of budget, so they, they deliberately send their, their employees off for weekends to football matches to concerts and stuff, so they're kind of forced to, to be friends. And, and, and that, that, in a city, for example, as small as Derry, that does make a huge impact. You know, so it's changing. Uh, yeah, I had a... Um, so I'm not sure I have a question mark at the end of my comment, but I just want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, multiple identity issue that, that you've been raising. One of the arguments that is made by unionists is that it's easier to be with a multiple identity within Britain as opposed to having it in Ireland. And, why, and we've been discussing the fact that uh, Sinn Féin would be the large, is the largest party and would be um, leading one storm on his back. But there's also another Sinn Féin that is probably going to be the biggest um, uh, party. It could, I mean, predictions are hard, particularly about the future. Niels Bohr said that, not me. Uh, but uh, 
it should be, uh, and, and I think it's going to be much harder not to um, start that or, or kind of fuel the conversation about the future when you have two sides of the island um, le led by, by Sinn Féin, which is one of their major, uh, th that's one of their major uh, platforms, I mean, the idea of, of reunification. Um, and I wonder, um, given that, I mean, I've, I've advocated the entire morning the, the, the constructive ambiguity, but one of the things that is not um, ambiguous in the Good Friday Agreement is the, is the issue that it's a binary choice. I mean, that ultimately you will have to choose either we're going to be here or there, whereas the multiple identity is something that cultivates the ability not to choose. Uh, but when you, when you actually have to vote, that is that that brings out there's a hierarchy in the multiple identities and ultimately that would be so i don't have a question i just have a comment but i wonder if you can if you can, can take I, this and yes. think about it if i, if I may well, that was a very interesting uh, series of comments uh, just on the on the binary question first of all yeah it, it is true the good friday agreement only offers a choice between irish unity or the union there have been other models suggested over the years, and notably the idea of an independent Northern Ireland or repartition. To be honest, I, I think the reason why we just had the binary choice in the Good Friday Agreement was because of the two documents I referred to earlier, in particular the Downing Street Declaration, the one which tried to reassure both nationalists and unionists about the legitimacy of their own aspirations. So the Downsley Declaration, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to summarise, but it effectively said that you can have constitutional change but on the basis of the so-called consent principle. But the, this was directed very much at Irish unity uh, because that was obviously what Sinn Féin and the Republican movement were interested in, nothing else really. So insofar as the Dynasty Declaration was looking at the two main traditions, the two main political objectives, that got carried over into the Good Friday Agreement. And it's, it's a fair point to make, should there not have been something a bit more subtle or a bit more uh, uh, ambiguous. But I mean, the, 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 the simple fact is that we were trying to demonstrate to those who had hitherto used violence to achieve, to pursue Irish unity, we were trying to show them that uh, they could actually have another way uh, uh, of achieving their goals by peaceful means. So it really meant that we were not interested in creating a distraction by talking about other models that had never really been tested. But you, on your Sinn Féin point, um, just a couple of reactions. The first thing is, of course, that Sinn Féin will not be, uh, I mean, assuming that we get back into the assembly and the executive, Sinn Féin will not be r ruling in a kind of majority sense as they would in in, in uh, perhaps another jurisdiction, depending on how they do. In the north, it has to be the two parties together. You, you know that sort of means that it is a, a mandatory or forced coalition. So Sinn Féin could not do something which the unionists are solidly opposed to. So that's in the north. Um, in the south, my guess is, I mean, it's anybody's guess, but I, I would be surprised if Sinn Féin in the next election had an overall majority. I think, you know, it's, I, I know nothing about it, but my guess is that there'll be a coalition of some kind, because that's in the nature of Irish politics these days, southern politics. So therefore, if it's a coalition, it means that Sinn Féin will not be able to dictate the agenda entirely on its own. Um, the last point to make is that the Good Friday Agreement makes clear the British government in the form of the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, uh, you know this, uh, uh, is supposed to convene um, a border poll or a referendum. But the point I was trying to make earlier and was slightly rushed uh, on my part was that that is not going to happen just suddenly out of the blue. No British government is going to pop a question like that without the deepest and the longest, most profound consultation with us. So the, the, the truth is, no matter what Sinn Féin... Yeah, of course, if Sinn Féin were in the government, they would be pressing for that poll to be held at the earliest possible moment. But the British government are the people who finally decide the timing of it. So really all I'm saying is that it's a fair point to make that... 
Sinn Féin appearing in power in bo both on both sides of the border could perhaps uh, destabilise unionism. So that, that's how I interpret your point. Um, but the truth is that there will be checks and balances in both jurisdictions. So I wouldn't be too... Uh, I, you didn't quite say that, but, but I, I, I mean, I don't think that Irish unity will be closer by virtue of Sinn Féin perhaps getting into office in the South, because it, 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 it takes two to tango. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that, that perhaps my comment. So the, uh, the discussion about the segregation uh, in Northern Ireland in the schools uh, is interesting. So it's coming from this context of this, uh, what I'm reading, a rapid secularization in Ireland. Uh, you know, Ireland is, is catching up to the rest of Europe and it's, you know, and it's, and it's the number of non-affiliated, and but what's particularly interesting is the speed at which it's catching up with the rest of Europe uh, is is somewhat unprecedented. And my thought on that was that this may smooth uh, the the future, you know, of, of union uh, with the North. But the comments about the uh, the growing numbers of, of uh, Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland and the segregation there, I'm just wondering if. Uh, to the degree that you know, has, has there been any comparable uh, move away from the Catholic Church uh, among Northern Irish Catholics? It's just my understanding there has been, yeah. We, we, yeah. we met with a group of uh, church leaders, uh, cross-border church leaders last week, and or, sorry, a couple of months ago, and, and they were saying as little as 2% of... of uh, Catholics in the South are regular attendees at, at Mass. I, I would say it's even less in, in, in Northern Ireland, to be quite honest. Uh, I don't know what the exact figures are, but that's my guess.